How much of a surprise is it that Culp is saying, look, negative industrial free cash flow uh, for this year, and how to fit this in with the, the, the overall picture of, of GE and its attempt to turn around? Yeah, I think, you know, we'll get the details here on the 14th, you know, on a conference call for updating the outlook for 19, but the key thing to understand here is that this number compared to the 4.5 is going to include a lot of costs associated with ending inventory finance, uh, getting rid of uh, intercompany uh, receivable uh, factoring. It's going to uh, see a wind down in the renewable business because of the big deposits for orders as um, the renewable ener energy credit uh, declines. So there's a lot of one time. Plus, we got fixed power. Now we estimated these costs to be six to nine billion. That's in our forecast. Will they all hit in 19? We have an operating free cash of four six. So we've got organic growth smaller company, right, because we've been divesting assets. We've got margins improving, okay. There's operating cash flow from continuing, and then you've got all these legacy issues. And then those legacy issues will still some be there in 2020, but they'll come down. And, you know, this, this rig will start rolling. So this still seems like, you know, it's spillback from issues we've known about for a long time. It's not necessarily saying that the existing industrial businesses have either mispriced contracts yeah. or they're doing poorly. There's legacy projects that came as a part of Alstom that, you know, the obligations yeah. you got to meet and burn off. But, you know, there's nothing here that that has shown any evidence that they veered off course with their current core businesses. Yeah. Are we going to get sort of a kitchen sink forecast from Larry Culp. I mean, I think that the thinking was when he first took over, there would be a kitchen sink, there would be a kitchen sink, and it seems to be coming out in drips and drabs when it comes to the GE story. So I think that's one of the good things to think about in terms of what are the hierarchy of relevance of key metrics for investors today. So the first thing he's done is put it pedal to the metal on increasing the liquidity of this company. And, you know, you had 75 billion in net debt, at the end of 18, we need to reduce that by 50 billion. Last week, he announced the sale by a pharma and you found 21. Okay, so there's still 30 billion more to go. One of the most interesting things that he said was that the healthcare, remaining healthcare business, 85% uh, after the by a pharma sale, he's retaining his optionality. Now, you can't do what originally was planned by his predecessor the IPO until you finish the biopharma sale, which would be a 2020 event. But we clearly believe there's a lot more levers that he has to pull on different assets which are non-core or targeted in one way or another. So you don't think this is a situation where the debt outweighs what the company's worth or what the company is going to be a situation? I mean, there have been We've done a, a liquidity circle. analysis, yeah. okay, and we have taken all the debt, 75 billion net, We've taken all the liabilities. That includes the pension underfunded? Okay, all that stuff. Underfunded pension, long-term health care, you know, 10 billion. Okay, resolution cost for litigation and government regulatory investigation. Okay, and the, you know, six to nine billion, we pulled seven and a half for the midpoint of that. Okay, put that in and then offset it with cash. Okay, that is coming in from asset sales. And we come out with, Becky, mm -hmm. 20 to 25 billion of net cash versus all liabilities hmm. and legacy. So let's think for a second about what he's really trying to do here. He's trying to maximize. How can GE be in a position where they have too much cash? Okay, so you, you, one of the clues, and it's a very important clue, is you saw an inversion in the debt that's on the industrial balance sheet at year end from the end of the third quarter. 70% is now industrial mm -hmm. instead of, I think it was like 33%, okay? And there's much less associated with the finance subsidiary. But you're still talking about something that's going to be something where we don't really see answers. You've just got to have faith and patience till 2020 and beyond? No, you're going to see answers very quickly as for, in terms of where all the cash is. And then when he has all the cash, what would he like to do? They spent 10 months last year trying to find somebody to write a reinsurance contract for this unquantifiable 15, now 10, could it be another 20? Uh -huh. That's what they're going to go through tomorrow, right. okay? And help us understand the assumptions and the actuarial you know, uh, decisions, and then get you to understand 10 billion is hit. So if I couldn't find somebody for, it wouldn't, you know, for 18, 20 billion to write me a reinsurance contract, to just put this in a, in a glass and drop it down a mine shaft with no recourse, right. then, then what I can do is I can put 10 billion down there 
And then when I put the 10 billion down there because I got so much cash, okay, I'm down to 25 billion, 10 billion EBITDA, two and a half times for the industrial, okay, I'm in the process now of taking and unshackling a very valuable asset, and that's GCAS. And if I can, t that's there to help, if you will, run the sub pumps on this obligation through 2023. Okay, but if I can move that back, because he, he clearly went down two paths the day he walked in the door. Do I sell by a farmer to my old firm, or do I turn around and sell GCAS to 500 people that are lined up around the block? GCAS is in its best shape in 20 years. Somebody's like, oh, gee, you know, uh, they've been marking all these gains up, right, on selling assets to you know, support the earnings. Actually, they got out of the older wide bodies, mm -hmm. okay, way ahead. Steve DeHazi and, and GCAS did this before the values of those came down.